Thank you, Jan, and uh, I do appreciate, I want to echo that as well, the work of our worship teams who, who give up their time, who apply themselves to uh, helping us worship. Because sometimes we need help, don't we, <laughs> with that? And uh, it's a challenge sometimes to get up and, and to uh, encourage people to do that, but uh, here they are every week helping us. This whole theme of hope lives here. The more I hear it, the more I say it over and over, the more I see it, the more I am convinced this is a really good and really relevant message for Central Christian Church. Are you getting a sense of that? By the way, we are making the things available as a way of, you know, letting people see it, broadcast that vision. Uh, go ahead and get window stickers. Go ahead and wear a catchy wristband. I don't wear a wristband, but you know what? I'll wear this one, right? I'll wear this one, and uh, let's not be shy about it. The average person is bombarded with somewhere from 4,000 to 10,000 advertisements a day. Nobody's sure of the exact number, but it starts somewhere around 4,000. Most of those are probably not worth the two seconds that it takes to look at them. But the message that people can find hope in Jesus Christ, that they can discover that uh, hope can be found here at Central Christian Church, that is a good message. That's worth getting people to see. Amen? Amen? So I encourage you to do that. Whatever way you choose, please get that message out. This morning I get to talk about our core values, the things that rise to the top when you ask, what is it that is really important to us? They aren't a mystery. In fact, I preached on these just under three years ago. So if the sermon sounds familiar, please don't check the archives. <laughs> just kidding. But like our vision and like our mission, we have Betty crocker our core values too, so that we can use those to help us bring hope to a world filled with hopelessness. That's why. Here they are. Biblical truth, disciple making, authentic community, selfless giving, God-anchored trust. We're going to talk about those for guess how many weeks? <laughs> there are five. So today we're lighting on this concept of biblical truth. And let me begin by saying that no matter who you are this morning, you want this. You already want this. You want to know the truth. Just like Tom Cruise in A Few Good Men saying to Jack Nicholson, I want the truth. You want this. It's something that should be of interest to everyone. Here's what I mean. There's a man on your front porch. The doorbell rings. You look through the little peephole or your ring uh, doorbell and you see that he looks like a policeman. He says he is a policeman. He has some ID in his hand. You'd like to know that's true, wouldn't you? You stand at the front of a church auditorium. The love of your life has just made some rather impressive promises to you. To stick with you through thick and thin. They are vows. You'd like to know they're true, wouldn't you? The doctor has you in his office. He says he has gone over your test results. He's even showing them to you. He says you need surgery. He tells you this surgery is necessary. He also tells you this surgery will fix the problem. You'd like to be able to trust that that's true, wouldn't you? There is a license on the wall at the pharmacy. It tells you, this document, that the pharmacist there has been to school, that this pharmacist knows what he or she is doing. Wouldn't you like to be able to trust that that is true? Commercial comes on TV. Commercial comes on the internet. It tells you this vaccine, just hypothetically, this vaccine is effective. It's safe. Your life will be better if you get it. Our lives will be better if you get it. It would be very helpful, wouldn't it, to know for sure whether or not that's true. You have a peanut allergy. For some people, that's life and death. 
So you read the ingredients list on the back of a box, and if the box tells you, nope, no peanuts in this, it's really important to you to know that that is true. You're also interested in what's true when you talk to the car salesman, when you look at the passenger limit on the airplane, when you read the appliance warranty, when you look at your insurance contract, when you look at your bank statement, when you pump gas into your car, you would like to know that the things that you're looking at are true. You care about this. Can I get a, I guess I do. Okay, we care about truth. I don't want to be lied to. I want the truth, no matter how slippery it may seem or how much you have given up maybe on finding it, you still would really like to know the truth. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Paul's writing to Timothy. He says, if I delay, I'm writing these things so you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of of the truth. And in case, by the way, that's not a word you use every day, buttress. Try support or foundation or ground or mainstay. You see, it is part of the church's business to support and uphold God's truth. Did you know that? The church is the pillar and support of the truth. That's why it's a core value here. We want to help people find the truth, understand the truth, accept the truth, and act on the truth. Amen? We're going to say that a few more times. So where will we find it? How can we find it? It's not just suddenly something that's going to erupt from inside of you. Because somebody feels deeply about something or they suddenly get a great idea, it doesn't mean that they have just now invented truth and that's where it comes from. Where are we going to find it? It's out there somewhere. Truth is going to make its way to you through some source outside of yourself. Just as surely as a pizza delivery guy delivers a pizza to your door, there is going to be to you a medium or media that are used as vehicles to deliver truth to you. That's better than Grubhub. You know, media. Ways to transfer a thought from one entity to another person's mind. Media. Smoke signals. Skywriting. Telegraph. Snail mail. Radio. Carrier pigeon. Clay tablets. Scrolls. Books. Graffiti. The arts. Movies. Videos. TV. And also places like Cable, networks, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, WhatsApp, TikTok, Reddit, Pinterest, Twitter. Those are all media. All things that people use to get an idea from one place to another. Oh yeah, also those things called books. Those two. Every one of those media can be used to deliver truth, which is great because after all, we want the truth don't we? We want to help people find truth, understand the truth, accept the truth, and practice the truth. Here's the thing about media. It has limits. I could play a sound for you this morning, like sometimes comes over a radio, but it's very limited. There's no visual to help you understand it. So I could show you maybe a still shot a picture of something, but that captures, you know what, only a very split second in time, isn't it? And it only captures where the camera is pointed. Even a video can be pointed only in one direction at a time, and it only goes where the camera operator is pointing it. Pictures and videos can be cropped and photoshopped, and when you've got a collection, let's say you've taken a thousand still shots and you've taken 10 hours of video and you've got just like 30 seconds to show it, you're not going to show it all. What are you going to do? You're going to pick the three pictures or the 10 seconds of video that you want to show. And which ones are you going to let people see? The ones that make your point. You know, I've 
Only so many minutes to speak this morning. I got to limit my words. No matter how hard you might try, you can't get the whole truth across. So, media's got limits, and media can be used to deliver the truth or deliver a lie. Printed media, also limited. Artists' work, limited. An artist, when he does a work of art, is trying to deliver a message. He's trying to make a point. He's trying to create a thought in somebody else's mind. But that thought <clears throat> is already limited by the artist's own worldview. When something is printed, if the author's writing isn't done well, if it isn't translated well, if the reader isn't a good reader, the message can get lost. Think about social media for a moment, as if you never did. Either social media is going to allow everything that people put on it to be posted, or it's going to be limited, isn't it? Limited by someone else's standards. Someone will decide for me what can and cannot appear on, you name it, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat. Somebody will decide that, or else everything will be allowed. Those are the only two choices. So media is, guess what, biased. Media is biased. With all of its limits, media has become the driving force of our day. It is the framework around which our economy is built. It is the place where people go to get news and information. It is the shaper of people's world's views. Have you noticed how everyone with a smartphone is a journalist? Everyone on the receiving end of that is being overloaded with information that affects our mental well-being. And this morning, whether you are 6 or 86, it's being done without any kind of a guide to assure that it's true. Now, what that does to our culture reminds me of the description of false teachers in 2 Timothy 3.7, where Paul describes them by saying they are always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Is that a problem? That's a problem. It is because we want to help people find the truth, to understand the truth, to accept the truth, to act on the truth. Isaiah is describing the spiritual status of Israel in chapter 59, Isaiah 59, verse 14. He says, justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away for truth has stumbled in the public squares and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it and it displeased him and there was no justice. Let me paraphrase real short for you. Equipment failure. Hang on. Maybe the Lord didn't want me to share. <laughs> Let me share with you the, the short paraphrase of those verses that I just read. When truth gets thrown under the bus, bad things happen. And worst of all, when truth gets thrown under the bus, it separates us from a right relationship with God. It was falling for a lie that first drove the wedge between mankind and God, and it has been falling for lies that has been driving the wedge between mankind and God ever since. That's why we want people to find the truth, to understand the truth, to accept the truth, to act on the truth. So this morning, with the time that we've got left here, I want to do just that. <clears throat> I want to invite you with me into the book of John, to look there at what Jesus said and what it says about Jesus there as a way to find this very important foundation for life, truth. Let's find the truth. Jesus was praying in the hours before his arrest and crucifixion. His heart is focused on the mission. He's asking the Father 
in chapter 17 to take care of the men to whom he is going to hand over the work when he goes back to heaven. And in the middle of that, Jesus inserts these words that spell out where we can find truth. John chapter 17, verse 17. Here it is. Sanctify them in the truth. What's it say? Your word is truth. Let's try that. Your word is truth. That's a whole other message by itself. God's word stands true. That's what Jesus said. Carrie is always looking for recipes and stuff to try out. And she found one that came up on uh, Facebook. It was for pancakes, which we don't eat a lot of. But these were made with no flour, only eggs and oats and a banana and a couple other things. And, well, I like those things. And I like the idea of trying to eat simple food. So we thought we'd give that a try and follow the directions to the T that this person had given, along with these glowing reviews about how great these were even had a photo of one on the griddle. Hey, that looks pretty good. <clears throat> so we followed the directions to a T, slapped one onto the griddle, but when it came time to turn it over, and there is a time you've got to do that, it did not turn over. It was like trying to turn over a pile of warm pudding. <laughs> no wonder, I thought later, the Facebook post didn't have a picture of one that was done, <laughs> only one that was cooking. They don't turn over. All they do is stir into this pile of banana, oat, and egg gruel. <laughs> and we were reminded of something that morning. Glowing reviews don't mean necessarily that something is true. And when those are untrue, those glowing reviews getting into the bigger issues of life, that can be a real problem. Most glowing reviews don't include the comments about what it's like now that you're pregnant, now that you're addicted, now that you've been caught, now that you're fired, now that you're expelled, now that you're broke, now that you're dead. Those don't show up in the review. Most instruments need to be tuned, <clears throat> especially to play along with other instruments. There's got to be a standard. There's got to be a, a true note that's reliable. You know, in an orchestra setting, when you're waiting for an orchestra to play, the principal violinist gets up and starts playing. It's an A, 440 hertz. Usually, if that's tuned correctly, everybody then starts to tune to the one violin so that everybody will play together and that it will sound together. In a concert band, it's usually the oboe who gets up and plays the perfect 440A. Well, now you've got apps and devices and stuff like that that can do it for you. You need it. You need a 440A. 440 hertz every time, exactly, when I turn it on on my phone. And there are devices that will play any note for you so that you can tune your whole guitar to it. Eddie, 8, Dynamite, Goodbye, Eddie. E, A, D, G, B, E. The notes of the guitar. There's a note for every one of them. It will tune perfectly because there's a standard that's true and reliable. You go back to it, and it's the same every time so that it's right. <clears throat> you know, when Jesus said... Your word is truth. He was giving for us something that you can rely on, something that you can always go back to, and it will always be useful and reliable and unchanging, something that will address every area of life where we need to know that there is something sure. So conduct your search for truth in God's word. You'll find the truth is there. Put it to the test. Cross-examine it. Put it under the microscope. Find the truth, and then understand the truth. Not every collection of truth is useful, is it? You ever read a legal document? may be true, but they aren't useful unless you can understand all of those words, and you may need an attorney just to explain them to you in regular English. 
you know, having that person you can go to for help would really be useful when it comes to the big questions in life, wouldn't it? So that you could understand the truth. Back in John again, chapter 1, verse 14. John is opening up this gospel. He's explaining some things about Jesus. He says this, the word, that's Jesus, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is full of truth. Let's get down to verse 17. It says the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. What if there was this person who was never wrong? Well, first of all, he'd be the next champion on Jeopardy. He would also be the person that you would go to in life for advice about money, about relationships, about priorities. And what if this person was 100% truthful all of the time about everything? You'd probably trust that person, wouldn't you? You'd buy a used car from that person. You'd enter into a business partnership without a pause. You might even trust him to look after your children. You would take his advice about marriage. You would listen with complete confidence to whatever it was he told you if he was always right and always truthful. Folks, Jesus is that person. When it comes to what's true in life, he is full of grace and truth. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So when I have questions about life's issues, I need both these. I need grace. How about you? And I need the truth. I need that person that I can turn to, that one who is full of grace and truth, Jesus Christ. We can find the truth. We can understand the truth. The next one is we need to accept the truth. Because I noticed something about truth. Even after it has been verified, even after things have been proven, people still have the option to ignore it. How is it that we do that? You ask any doctor, any doctor what their greatest frustration is regarding their patients, they will tell you it is the patients who hear their instructions and then ignore them. People make the effort to visit the doctor. They pay the doctor. They may even go through some difficult tests. They can see the test results. They can listen to the words of the trusted doctor. They can even do a Google search just to cross-check on him or her. And then they can still choose not to take the medication, not to adjust the diet, keep on smoking, keep the same hectic schedule. Why do we do that? Well, it's not because we don't know that it's true. It's because we choose not to accept it. It's not because we have doubts. It's because we choose to disbelieve. Like Mark Twain said, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. Samuel Clemens didn't write those words because he was sure the Bible isn't true. He was sure that he didn't want to give it a place of authority in his life. To him, the thought that we ought to listen to Scripture and accept it, that was too much of a bother. Problem wasn't that it wasn't true. There comes a point for every person who hears about Jesus Christ and who is faced with with the claims of his existence and the claims that he made about himself, there comes a point that you have to make a decision. It ceases to be an exercise in your head and it becomes instead a battle in your heart. Will you accept it? Jesus often spoke to people who were at this very point. Either they would accept the evidence, they would look at the things they saw and could not intellectually deny, or they would turn a hardened heart against him. 
wasn't just about mentally acknowledging some facts. It was about deciding whether or not they would accept him, whether or not they would accept this person who is God in the flesh, this person who embodies truth itself, this one who said about himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. For your sake, Whoever you are this morning, I want you to accept the truth. Not just to say that you agree with it. In fact, you can't do that. You can't say that you agree with that truth and reject it and remain intellectually honest. I've used it before. There's a quote from C.S. Lewis that gets used a lot. It deserves to be used a lot. In his book, Mere Christianity, he wrote these words. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. This is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to we want to help people find the truth understand the truth accept the truth and act on the truth so guess what that brings us to now that part of acting on and not just talking about these things Jesus was standing before Pilate Pilate's trying to figure out what to do with this man that the Jewish leaders want dead, but who seems innocent to him. So he's talking to Jesus, trying to get some kind of an angle that he could use, apparently to release him. But Pilate is about to cave in to the pressure. John chapter 18, Pilate says to Jesus, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose... I was born, and for this purpose, I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. Truth would stumble in the public squares of Jerusalem again that day. Truth would be nailed to a cross and die. But Jesus would prove himself true by rising from the dead on the third day. Everyone who is of the truth listens to his voice. Very open agenda here at Central Christian Church. Very first core value among us. We're trying to help people be of the truth. This morning you could show that you have listened to the voice of Jesus as he invites you to follow him. You can become a person who has found, who has understood, who has accepted, and now who acts on the truth. The question is, would you do that today? Whether you're online or here in person today, if you're somebody who up to this point in your life maybe has heard over and over and over the truth about Jesus, the truth of the gospel, but never responded to it, you have heard, you have found, you have understood, will you accept that truth? Now that the battle in your mind has been waged, what about the one in your heart? Would you accept today Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your life? Will you make it known and then act on 
the fact that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be. There are some next steps. There are things for you to do to become a follower, a disciple of Jesus. And we would love to help you find that truth, understand it, accept it, and act on it today. Get in touch with us. If you're online, uh, get in touch with us, cccrockford.org slash connect. Uh, fill out one of the virtual cards there, and we'll get in touch with you right away. Or maybe you're here this morning in person, and you're thinking about this decision. If you haven't made it, you need to. You need to think about this. I'll be right here as soon as we dismiss in just a little bit. The rest of us who have accepted Christ, who have made that choice, we know the truth. We have accepted that truth, and yet, if you're like me, it's a good time to do some self-evaluation and to say, I'm not always acting on that truth. And this morning, I need to do that. I need to have a one-on-one -on -one with God while I stand here and talk to him about how my life is going to better reflect I believe these things. I accept them. Let's stand up together. Let's pray. Father, we do stand before you uh, this morning belonging to you already. Yet you have given us the freedom to choose you. The freedom, the ability to love to honor you, to recognize your goodness to us. So, Father, help us, please, in light of your truth, in light of Jesus Christ, this morning to make choices that will honor you, not just to acknowledge things, not just to say things, but then to act on these truths. Help us, Lord, not to be hindered in doing that right now. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.